Thanks, RJ. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I hope I'm as clever as you make me sound, but uh, I'll try to give some uh, good tips and some, some information today. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming, kind of like RJ said. I know your time is valuable, and um, I, I hope we can give you some information and some ideas that will uh, help keep your family safe. Um, to kind of introduce myself, I've been with Con Content Watch, the makers of Net Nanny, for almost 13 years now. Um, I've, I've had the chance to see our products evolve and, and see the industry really evolve. Uh, obviously, when I started, it was um, it was one of those uh, families all shared one computer. Uh, we all had a, a Windows 95 or a 98 computer that was uh, in the family room, and, and people would uh, share it as a family. And now the, the world's really changed as far as the technology. Um, as RJ mentioned, the, the the title of today's demonstration is Eight Tech Tips for Parents with uh, with Clever Kids. Um, to kind of give you an idea, I um, like I mentioned, I've I, I've I've seen that nanny uh, evolve. We've had the opportunity to uh, have it actually sold in 157 countries. Um, over a million people are using the NetNanny product, but a lot of the ideas or the um, technologies I'm going to talk about today are not going to be specific to NetNanny. We're really concerned about helping you protect your family in every way you can, and if it's not something that NetNanny can do, we're going to give you some suggestions on alternatives um, and uh, some things that you can do even though it may not be part of our, of our actual product. Um, to kind of start out, I kind of want to talk a little bit about some tech trends. Uh, RJ mentioned this a little bit right now, but uh, back in uh, 2012, there was a study, and they determined that half of the parents with children between the ages of 5 and 15 um, felt like that their kids knew more about the Internet that they, than they did. And 70% of, of parents between, with kids between the ages of 12 and 15 uh, feel like their kids now know more about the Internet than they do. And uh, we actually posted this uh, on our blog the other day, but I thought it was a, a funny... Uh, Funny comic, uh, the, the kid's offering to give his dad free tech support um, in exchange for an increase in his allowance. Um, I actually had kind of a personal experience with that. Uh, the other day my wife called at work and she was trying to get our Chromecast to work with a tablet. And I was really busy. I didn't have time to help her uh, troubleshoot online. And I said, well, go ask uh, Sterling. And Sterling's my five-year-old. And he can figure it out. So uh, kids obviously are, are becoming more tech savvy all the time. Um, I, as I kind of talk today, I want to use a, a, a kind of an, an analogy. Um, I found a quote on a blog that said, uh, "Getting past mom and dad online could be mo could be the modern version of sneaking out." And you know, I, I kind of, as I was actually looking for a picture of someone sneaking out, I, I don't know if this is me or not, but um, I kind of started thinking a little bit about uh, when I was a kid. Uh, the way that we uh, we tricked mom and dad was we would sneak out, and it, it seemed like it was the the cool thing to do when I was a kid. I grew up in a rural rural town. Uh, we would uh, talk about it at lunch. Friends would give you ideas. Uh, we would talk about how you could sneak out at night. And the funny thing is, I I didn't really even have a purpose to sneak out. It was just more uh, curiosity. It was part of being a teen, I guess. Um, and as I was looking online, I actually found this website that mentions uh, how to sneak out. It's pretty funny if you ever want to take a look at it. It gives you the step-by-steps. <laughs> and believe it or not, when I read it, it pretty much matched what we would try to do. Um, and, you know, I, I think when we, uh, when we think about some of these things our kids do to, to get around Internet filters, sometimes we, we tell jokes or we talk about them being mischievous or, or maybe bad kids. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad. It just means that they're, they're curious, kind of like uh, the kids that, that were trying to sneak out, you know. 25, 30 years ago. And, and I'm not saying that it's uh, not something we should be concerned about. That's why we're here today. But if, if we kind of look at it that, on that point of view, um, we can understand why maybe kids do some of these things. Um, as I mentioned, when I was a kid, uh, it was kind of uh, if you want to be cool or if you want to prove you're independent, you'll find a way to sneak out of your house. And in our case, uh, there was nothing to sneak out for. We'd go around and stand in the park, but uh, it was just something that teenagers tried to do. Uh, today, I'm going to cover kind of eight topics. Um, eight ideas, uh, ways that kids try to get around uh, parental controls or, or mom and dad monitoring what they're doing on the internet. Um, I'll talk about the topic, the way that people do this, and then I'll try to give some suggestions, uh, some ideas on how you can uh, prevent this or, or limit it in your homes. Uh, the first one I want to talk about today is uh, it's specific to mobile devices, to tablets and smartphones, and it's the concept of hiding applications or photos or videos on a smartphone or a tablet. Um, and uh, obviously you can see why someone would do this. They maybe want to keep a bunch of pictures that they don't want mom and dad to know about or they want to install apps that uh, maybe aren't appropriate or are 
are used to get inappropriate content. Um, both Android and, and iOS devices uh, have this, uh, this type of technology and basically what it is is you can install an app and then within that app you open it up and select the other apps on your, on your device that you want to hide. And now the icons for those apps no longer appear. Uh, they all are hidden within your, your app hider. Um, and obviously uh, these are typically uh, password protected so that if you, if you do tap on the app uh, nothing really opens, you just get prompted for a password. And that's one of the ways that people typically uh, will hide apps on their mobile devices or on their smartphones. Um, another real common one is just the out of sight, out of mind te technology where people will uh, create a folder and, and dump a bunch of apps in it because they don't think anyone will ever look in the folder. Um, or um, the the last one that I wanted to mention is it's basically called obscurity. And obscurity is the concept of you install an app that uh, has an icon that represents something uh, benign or innocent, and it's got a name that sounds relatively innocent, but when you open it up, uh, it, it has inappropriate content in it. And these are just some some examples I found. For example, this My Photo album. It's an it's an app on, on iTunes. You install it, um, but it doesn't look at your photos on. On, on your Apple device. It uh, looks at photos online or other photos that you include in the in the, in the the app, but um, they're not necessarily viewed when you go look at the photo roll. Um, the app hide application, it does just like I said, you install it, it, uh, it will uh, allow you to choose other apps and it will hide it within itself. Uh, and these are just some, some really small examples, obviously. Um, there are hundreds of these types of apps and it's really hard to keep track of it. Um, I got an email earlier this morning from, from one of our attendees and, and um, one of the questions was, well, how do I stay on top of this? And, and the truth is there are so many of these apps and they change every single day that you're, you're never going to know all of them. Um, so I, I kind of have some suggestions on ways that you can um, eliminate this or, or um, put some, some tabs on your kids. And the first one is uh, review the apps that are installed on the device. Um, there's several ways you can do this. Um, it could be as simple as, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to borrow your iPad and I want to see what's installed. Um, there are solutions that you can install on on some devices. For example, our NetNanny for Android, when you install it, it actually takes an inventory of all the apps on the device. Um, but you really need to take a look of what's installed. Um, just because we decide we're our, 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 our kids are mature enough to uh, have a smartphone or a tablet doesn't necessarily mean they're mature enough to be wise in their decisions on what kind of applications they're going to install and what they're going to do with those apps. So reviewing the apps is really important. Um, also, along with that, um, you should consider stopping the installation of new apps on a device if it's something that you're, you're concerned about. Um, iOS actually has built into it for iPads and iPhones and, I, um, and I, I, iPads. Uh, the ability to stop anyone from installing a new app. So you can actually block out iTunes. Um, you can also allow iTunes but require a password for the installation. Um, Android uh, does something similar but you, you typically have to install an app manager like the one that we included in NetNanny and it allows you to uh, um, block the installation or the running of new apps until you decide to approve them. And this is a great way actually to kind of keep, keep uh, communication open with your kids on what they're doing, uh, what they want. Um, it's not that hard for you to enter a password when somebody wants to add a new app, but then you have an idea of what, what's being installed instead of just looking at the screen with 50 apps and you have no idea what any of them are and what they're doing. Um, and the last one obviously is if you don't know what an app is, uh, take some time to look it up. Uh, Google and Apple both have great descriptions on, on their apps. They'll tell you what, it, what they do. Um, if there's an app that's a little sketchy on your uh, on your tablet, uh, you can look it up and you'll see comments, you'll see uh, information about what it does, and you, you can kind of follow it from there. But these are see some really uh, simple steps, but they're important. Obviously, um, content comes from many different sources now. It's not just a web browser, and so looking at the apps on the device is very important. Uh, using an app manager is obviously going to make your life easier, um, and because you can do it remotely, you can do it in a web browser, you can block things. Um, but this is, these are some, some simple sol solutions that I wanted to suggest today. Uh, the number two that I wanted to talk about is, obviously this is a big one and, and it's kind of broad, but it's the removing or bypassing a, a web filter or a parental control app. Um, we get emails all the time from people that will reference a link on the internet, like this one I'm showing you right here, how to remove web filters. And the, and the email says, um, is it really this easy to remove NetNanny from my computer? 
um, and typically it is not. Um, <laughs> so the, the, there's some good news there, but um, and and I'll drill into that a little bit later on on how you can protect that, and we'll go into that. But some of the ways, obviously, that people are removing or bypassing web filters, or they're simply uninstalling it. Um, if you have a parental control application that's not password protected, um, there's no reason your 15-year-old won't just remove it. And typically, the uh, the conversation goes like this: Well, it was blocking the site that I wanted to do homework on. And if it's true or not, uh, I guess that's within your family. But uh, typically, just removing it is um, is something that almost every teen's going to do, just because they don't like the concept of it being there. So you want some kind of a parental control that's that's strong enough that you can't just remove it. Um, obviously, the the how to hack it off your computer. That's another way that people do the the Google searches uh, using proxy sites. Um, on mobile, content filtering is typically confined to a custom web browser. So if uh, if you install a content filtering browser on a mobile device, let's say on an Android or or a an iPad, and somebody goes and installs a new uh, a new web browser, that web browser is typically not going to be filtered, and that's important to know because uh, a lot of times, even with our NetNanny for iOS right now, we we get calls from people that say, "Well, I installed NetNanny." But every time Skippy opens Chrome, he can go wherever he wants. Well, that's because Chrome's not protected, and that's kind of the way it works on mobile devices. And I'll talk about that in a little bit later as well. Um, giving kids admin rights on, on your computer, and I'm going to go over this several times today, is basically giving them the keys to do whatever they want on the computer. So regardless of what software or settings you put on a computer, if someone has admin rights, they're going to do whatever they want. Um, and, I'll, and I'll drill into that a little bit later. And then one of the other ways is obviously remote access to other devices. And this is starting to get a little bit more technical, but kids will use a, uh, a remote desktop client or a tunneling client to get into another computer that doesn't have parental control set up or doesn't have web filters set up to be able to go wherever they'd like on the Internet. So some of the suggestions I had, obviously, uh, have a parental control application. That's, that's pretty... Uh, Pretty key and pretty important. Obviously, you, at NetNanny, you can, you can tell that's important to us. Um, but you want to make sure that it's a strong parental control application, something that is password protected for overriding settings, password protected for for uninstalling. Um, don't let your family be administrators. Um, this is this is something that it's a uh, it's kind of hard to understand if if you don't understand the concepts behind it. But when people like Microsoft or Apple uh, created operating systems for PCs and Macs. The concept was that the um, administrator was uh, an IT person, someone that could go in and uh, make changes, uh, remove software, delete files, and that administrative rights. Uh, there's there's several things that come with it. Obviously, it's easy to get infected with a virus if you're running as an administrator because if you click on a virus, it now has your rights and it can run rampant on your computer. Um, but also giving a, a teen or a child administrator rights gives them the ability to install any kind of application they'd like, gives them the ability to go in and make changes to registries or delete files. Now NetNanny, we've, we've put a lot of work into making it um, strong as far as circumvention so that people can't just uninstall it or just delete a file. Uh, but it, anyone with administrative rights can write a program or do enough work on a computer to disable or remove parental controls. So you want to consider uh, creating local accounts or individual accounts for your family or even just a secondary account called family that everyone shares but it maybe is not the administrator. Um, you want to uh, obviously in your home have some kind of a usage policy. Um, we talk to lots of people that ask for suggestions that say you know well I put this on my, my uh, kids computer and now they're angry. Um, and uh, that's human nature. Obviously, people don't want to be monitored. They don't want to be protected um, if, if they never have before. But if you grow up with the concept of, hey, we have this policy in our home. Mom and dad say that they're going to put parental controls on anything that I use. They're going to review where I go on the Internet. It doesn't come to, as a shock or it doesn't become a, um, a sensitive subject when you tell your 14 or 15 year old, hey, we want to look and, and just make sure where you're going on the Internet is safe. So that's a, that's a suggestion that we have for you as well. Uh, number three, using a proxy web page or anonymous browsing mode. Um, so a lot of web browsers, Chrome, uh, Firefox, Mozilla, have what's called an anonymous mode. Um, basically, it's in the corner. You click on it, and in Chrome it says incognito. That's what we have here. For, for By going there, basically what it does is it uh, doesn't include any of your web traffic in your browser history. Um, it uh, sometimes will 
bypassed any plugins, so things like uh, a browser plugin that does content filtering or a DNS filter. Uh, they will bypass all of those and it will just let you go straight to the internet. This is just built into browsers. Um, so this is obviously uh, something that's uh, used quite frequently to get around uh, content filtering. Also things like proxy websites. Uh, proxies used to be something that you had to go into your browser and set up a port and an IP address. Now it's just something that you can do by going to a website and then surfing through their website to get the content that you want. Um, believe it or not, there are a lot of people that feel like just looking at your inter at the internet logs or the internet history gives them a, an idea of where people go on the internet. And uh, obviously that's not going to be a, an accurate representation of what your family's doing because it can easily be deleted. There are programs that will delete them instantly as soon as you close your browser or um, will delete them as you go along. So um, obviously I, I wanted to show you a picture kind of what this looks like. So th this is a uh, proxy website called CyberGhost VPN. Um, you'll notice up here at the top you can see the, the URL that I've gone to. However, once I get to this website, I don't come up here to the top and type in an inappropriate website. What I do is I type it in down here and I click the anonymize, anonymize me button and when I go to that next website, up here at the top it still says cyberghostvpn.com, but then the website would contain the content that I requested uh, directly from the internet. So this website's basically proxying or bringing the content to my screen without telling my browser or my computer, hey, this is coming from playboy.com, for example. Um, and this is kind of how proxy websites typically work. Um, now there's, there's a lot of things you can do to prevent these kind of sites. Um, obviously the purpose for this is to, to hide where you're going on the internet. And so some of the suggestions we have is to have a parental control app that does dynamic filtering. What that means is that you want a parental control or a web filter that looks at the content that's in your, on your screen not just the name of the website. Um, in, my, in my example here with the CyberGhost, in the case of let's say NetNanny because it does dynamic contextual analysis, if someone went down here below and typed in uh, playboy.com and clicked anonymize me, although the URL may still say CyberGhost VPN, NetNanny is going to detect that there's uh, inappropriate content on the screen and it would block it. So having a, a parental control that is not network based, that is not going to uh, do it based on the name of the site, but is actually going to do it on the on the name of the, excuse me, the type of content appearing on the screen is very important. Uh, next one, don't make your family administrators. Um, you like, like I talked about before, you can still go in and set up a proxy server that your whole computer runs through or a proxy server that your browser runs through and by doing that it makes it uh, hard to know where your family's going on the internet and it makes it hard for reporting. Um, and, and the last one, we, I, I kind of laugh about this, but don't think that the internet history that you look at is an adequate way to see what your family's doing online. Um, we, uh, we get some occasional calls from people that say, well, I checked his internet history and it doesn't say that he went anywhere. Well, that, that internet history is um, very inaccurate. It only includes what you go to directly. It doesn't include anything like uh, anonymous surfing or proxy servers. Um, it doesn't include any of the other ways people use to get around it. So uh, these are just kind of some of the suggestions that we wanted to present today. The number fourth, and uh, I've gone through this a couple times now, is uh, the concept of administrative rights on a PC or device. Um, these are just some of the common phrases that we hear from, from kids on why they need administrative rights on their computer. This actually overflows from, from IT. Um, IT administrators deal with the same problem of the sales team comes to the IT administrator and says, well, I need to be an admin on my laptop. And the, the IT administrator says, well, if you do that, it makes it so you could be infected with a virus and you're going to make a lot of work for me because you could really mess up your computer and, and all these things. And, and they say, well, what if I need to install an app? Or I, need, I hate having to get the admin to run an update. Or I hate... Um, having to track someone down when I need to do X on my computer. And these are just some, some typical phrases that, that our kids use as well. The problem is when you give someone administrative rights, it's, it's the keys to the kingdom. They can do anything they'd like on their computer. And a lot of times when we go through the setup of our computer for the first time, it's we just want to get to a screen, right? We just want to get somewhere where uh, now we can start using the computer. So we just keep clicking next. And uh, Windows or Mac prompt to say, hey, do you want to create some users? No, I just want to get this done with. And that's kind of how, how we go through the setup. 
Um, for those of you that are maybe running your computer as, as one user and everyone's using the computer and administrative rights, it's simple. Go into control panel, go into Mac settings, choose users and choose create a new user and they'll give the option to create an administrative user or a standard user. They can still use the computer just fine, but it's going to lock them out from making tweaks and changes to the computer, uh, changes to settings that can potentially get around content filtering. So the, the, the obvious uh, suggestions on this are, remember that admin rights are, are the keys to the kingdom. Uh, consider creating separate users for your family. And they maybe don't need to ha all have their own user account. That would be up to you or the way you want to do things with your family. But you do want to have a separate account for typical use outside of the administrative account. Um, and the last thing to keep in mind about this is it's going to require time and effort on your part. Part of the reason why IT administrators or even parents give their kids administrative rights to their computer or to their laptop is because it's it's cumbersome to have to type in your password when your kids want to install a new app. It's cumbersome to uh, have to install your uh, in, it, it, type in the administrative password when somebody wants to run some kind of an update. But it's a really a good way to keep your computer safe. It helps keep spyware and malware off it, and it will prevent a lot of those things we've talked about before. Um, if a computer is logged in as a standard user and has, for example, NetNanny installed, it is basically impossible to remove the software because uh, that user doesn't have the rights to delete any files um, and it, even if they were an admin we've made it very very difficult but as a standard user you've really uh, locked things down. This one's kind of a uh, growing it's the concept of using a messaging app rather than texting um, to uh, get around parental controls and monitoring. So these are just some some of the more popular ones, there are literally hundreds of these applications that people put on their mobile devices. Um, the great thing about these applications are that you don't need to have a cell phone plan on your tablet or your iPod and you can still text your friends, which is a great feature. Um, it's a great way to uh, give kids uh, the ability to text and communicate without having to buy a data plan for them and they can just do it at Wi-Fi. And uh, so th these aren't necessarily bad applications. Um, the reason I, we mention these applications is the way people get, get around their parents is that more often than not, <coughs> kids will choose to use these applications uh, to text inappropriate, to, for sexting, for uh, bullying, because these applications are much harder to track than text messaging. Uh, mom and dad are usually uh, tech savvy enough to say, hey, I want to look at your phone and I'm going to look at your text messages. And uh, a lot of times, uh, they're not smart enough to know which of these apps to look in and these apps can also be password protected so uh, I pick up my daughter's iPad and I want to know who she's talking to on GroupMe I tap on it it asks me for a password I don't know what it is and, and now I'm kinda out of luck so these are kinda some of the uh, apps that like we mentioned they're not bad uh, they're, they've got great functionality um, but there's some of the ways that people use uh, or kids use to get past uh, monitoring by mom and dad so we have a few suggestions here uh, this goes back to the apps that we talked about before. Know what the apps are. If the apps are uh, on on a mobile device, if they're uh, on a phone, know what they know what they do and know what the purpose is. Um, using an app manager is a, a great way to get that information. You can also use an app manager to block things that become uh, a problem in your home. Uh, never assume that all the texting or the the communications. Um, comes from the texting app or the texting icon in on your iPhone or on your Android device because most of the time kids are not using that as their primary communication method they're using uh, one of these other applications. And the last one if there's an issue consider using a, 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 an app manager and, and locking some of these apps out. Uh, just because someone has a, a mobile device doesn't necessarily mean that they need to have the rights to run every kind of application or every application that they want to install. Um, that kind of goes back to our first suggestion as well is if you decide to to run your household or, or work with your kids and say I'm going to approve apps before you just install it, it helps you get a handle of, of what's going on on those mobile devices. Uh, the sixth one I want to talk about today is uh, the concept of creating face uh, fake Facebook or social media accounts. In uh, 2012, uh, CNN did a report that 800, excuse me, 83 million Facebook accounts were fake, and that means about an estimated 9% of all the Facebook accounts online are not fake. Uh, excuse me, are fake, are not real. Um, 
it's a, it's interesting when you uh, when you think about it. Why would kids create a fake Facebook account? Well, when Facebook first came out, or any social media network for ma for that matter, parents weren't necessarily savvy. So kids could get on; they didn't weren't concerned about mom and dad friending them or talking to them. But we're we're becoming more uh, more involved. Obviously, we want to be p good parents. We want to be involved in what they're doing online. Monitor for bullying. We want to help our our kids learn how to communicate correctly. And so what kids will often do is they'll create a Facebook account, but uh, they'll create a secondary account that that's the one that they friend mom and dad through. And they uh, that's the one that they will uh, oftentimes uh, use kind of as a dummy account while they spend the rest of their time talking with their friends or, or communicating on the other. Um, so there's there's some things you can do to kind of check and see if their social media account is, is legitimate or is it real. Um, a lot of us have have taken the time to friend our our kids. Um, I, I I regularly speak with parents that their their policy is, okay, you're 14, you can have a social media account, but part of the policy is I get to be one of your friends, and and that that's obviously uh, just a preference or an idea. But um, if you're monitoring your kid's social media account, look at it and see is there activity. If uh, if I have friended Skippy and there's no activity on there for the last month. Um, it's not that Skippy's inactive, it's that he's using a different account because kids are, are active on these all the time. Um, look at your kid's friends list. Does it include real friends that you really know about? Because uh, if not, it, it's very likely that they're speaking or communicating with their friends through another method, another account, or another uh, type of social network. Uh, try sending them a message. See if your kids respond because if they've created a dummy account, they're not monitoring it frequently. Um, and this goes back to application managers. If you're concerned about your kids, if you don't feel like you can you can keep tabs on it, um, if you create a family policy that you you want to monitor and it and it becomes problematic, consider using an app manager. App managers will allow you to control what type of apps are on the device. Some families say, okay, well we've decided it's okay for for you to have a Facebook account, but that doesn't mean you can have a Twitter and a Tumblr and an Instagram account. We just want to limit it. And so by using an app manager, you can still allow your kids to use social media, but you have kind of tabs on what type of social media they're using. Um, the last one I wanted to point out is the concept of using a, a social media monitoring tool. Obviously, we created a tool called NetNanny Social that allows you to monitor your kids' social media profiles. Um, it allows you to uh, monitor what's being said, what they're saying, who's talking to them, as alerts based on bullying or inappropriate contacts. Um, it's a good way to uh, monitor what's going on with your family and uh, it's, uh, it's cloud-based, it's easy to use, um, but there's several of these tools that, that do similar things and allow you to kind of keep tabs on your family on, and their social media accounts. Um, the seventh one I, I wanted to cover is the concept of anonymizer software. So once your kids have, have gone through the, the process of uh, I have a computer now. Uh, mom and dad locked me out of admin. I can't install um, new applications, or I um, I can't get around the content filtering. They'll start looking for ways to to uh, bypass the filtering. And kind of back to my scenario of um, of sneaking out. Uh, kids at school talk about this all the time. Well, how do you, how do we get around it? My mom and dad put net nanny on my computer, or we've set up this uh, firewall that blocks all this stuff. How do I get around it? Anonymizer softwares. Um, are very um, common. They're a little bit complex to set up, but most teenagers can figure it out pretty quickly. And the concept is basically that you have an executable, you run it, and it creates a VPN connection to another server or another device. And then all your traffic comes in over that VPN connection. UltraSurf is uh, one of the common ones, but there are hundreds of these. And, and the thing about it is that we need to be aware is that sometimes the software doesn't even need to be installed. It can be as simple as plugging in a USB key and running the application off the key. And uh, people will oftentimes look at a computer and say, well, it's not installed, I don't have any problems. Um, but they're unaware that their, their teens plug it in a USB key and, and firing this up. Um, some suggestions, again, don't, don't make your family an administrator. Most of these softwares will not run on your computer if you're not an administrator. It won't. The, you, if you don't have rights to create a, a VPN connection out to some remote hacking server, it's not going to allow you to do it. Um, so that's that's the biggest way to stop that. Um, also, review the applications installed on your PC, your Mac, and your mobile devices. We've talked about this before. 
Um, and then the last one, install a content filtering application that will dynamically filter web content locally. So going back to this scenario here, I'm going to jump back one slide. If I'm uh, on this picture here on the right hand side, if I'm, if I'm this computer and I'm requesting content from the web and it's going through several computers and coming back and get, arriving on my computer, if I have a content filter installed that looks at what's going to appear on my screen, it doesn't matter where the content came from, I will still be protected. So if a, a, an ambitious teen or child decides to install um, some USB key and they encrypt in the data to get out to the internet, uh, a, a, locally a locally installed content filter that looks at the at content dynamically will do a really good job at preventing uh, inappropriate content from arriving. Uh, the last one I just wanted to talk about was uh, websites that seem safe but aren't necessarily safe. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of times we we see a name and it's recognized and and we don't necessarily uh, associate that with inappropriate content. Um, but the internet's changed quite a bit. It used to be that websites were static pages uh, that there was a webmaster that created the site. Uh, but now the internet is very much user generated. People can post pictures, videos, comments. Uh, websites change all the time. These are just uh, a few sample websites that I kind of thought of. But user generated content. Um, Obviously, regardless of who owns the site, they have no control of, of what kind of content is on that site. Um, Wikipedia is a great example. Um, YouTube. Um, I took I took this screenshot from uh, from a YouTube page, but they uh, they have adult content embedded in it, and YouTube does it a does attempt to block you from accessing it if you're not 18, but it doesn't take much to say, yeah, I'm 18, and move on. Um, Wikipedia. Because it's a free post for anyone, there's some really inappropriate content embedded in Wikipedia. Now, does it mean these websites are bad? Absolutely not. There's great content on YouTube and Wikipedia and other user-generated content that is uh, helpful and entertaining to our families. Uh, but we do, do need to be aware that these websites have embedded in them other kinds of content that's not appropriate. Shopping sites. Um, Amazon, believe it or not, if you do specific searches on Amazon, you can find inappropriate pictures embedded in the website. Reference sites, like I said, Wikipedia, image and search engines, uh, places like Bing or Google, they have uh, the ability to search videos and images right from the web page without having to go to another web page. And so these are some of the ways that, that people are uh, getting inappropriate content, or you, our kids are, uh, without us necessarily knowing about it. So here's some, some suggestions that we have. Uh, install a content filter that will dynamically look at the content. We talked about that. Uh, for example, Wikipedia. If you have a, a content filter installed that looks at the content, for example, NetNanny, obviously, um, if somebody does a, a search on Wikipedia for something inappropriate, um, we, this filter will detect it and block it. So it doesn't mean you have to block all of Wikipedia. Your kids can still use it to do research for school or learn about the turtles in the Caribbean or whatever, but they don't necessarily uh, have the risk of being exposed to inappropriate content um, unintentionally or even attention intentionally. Um, safe search. All search engines on the internet have an option called safe search. Safe Search uh, basically filters out known websites that host inappropriate content and doesn't include it in your in your searches. So in in the screen before I showed you a picture of Bing, Bing has a video search that uh, allows me to search for any video on the internet and will actually show it thumbnail size on the Bing web page playing instantly without actually having to go to the website. Well, the problem with that is that there's so much inappropriate content on the internet that if I go to Bing and I turn off Safe Search and I type in a phrase that sounds relatively innocent, I don't know, Jessica, um, there are ch there's a very high probability that there's going to be an internet video somewhere that's inappropriate that has the name Jessica in it. And it's just going to start playing on, in Bing's window. Now, there's a few things you can do to prevent that. One, having that local content filter installed, it will, it will block it. But two, if you turn on Safe Search, um, those kind of websites are going to be filtered out when you do those searches. The bad thing about Safe Search is that it's very easy to disable. So you also would want a parental control ap application that enforces Safe Search, that doesn't allow people to turn it off um, and uh, 
NetNanny obviously does that as well. Um, I mentioned that on used parental controls that keep it on. Um, and the last one is you're going to want to review your family's web activities. Um, you want to just take a look at where people are going, not just the names of the sites, but what did they see on the site. Um, if I'm looking at a, at a web report that shows me my kids went to Wikipedia, I'm going to want to spend a little bit of time looking at that saying, well, where did you go on Wikipedia? So that I can get some information about what they're looking for, what kind of searches they're doing. And again, a, a good parental control app will always help, uh, help out with those. So these are obviously some uh, simple examples, but it talks about some of the really more advanced or sneaky techniques that our kids are using to uh, kind of get around the parental controls and the settings that we're implementing in our homes. Um, so I kind of want to go back to my, my analogy of the sneaking around on the internet. Um, so I'm going to just tell a quick personal story. I told you how uh, when I uh, was 15 we used to think it was cool to sneak out. And my dad did a lot to make it hard, but because I spent time with my friends at school and I learned the techniques, I was able to sneak out. Um, and one night we were standing around the park doing nothing. I don't know why we would sneak out now that I think about it, but at, I was 15. And uh, a truck pulled up with a whole bunch of intoxicated cowboys. And they decided it was the middle of the night and we were a good group of uh, kids to beat up. And as we're standing there in the park, uh, scared for our lives, from behind the bushes, out walked this who seemed to me to be an old man, my dad. And as soon as he walked out from behind the bushes, the cowboys decided they didn't want to beat us up and they scattered and, and drove off. And uh, my dad, even though he was unable to stop me from sneaking out, um, he was doing everything he could to help keep me safe. And I was grateful for it, obviously. But um, all of us, obviously, on the Internet, we're, not, we're never going to be able to stop everything. But if we do our part, if we're vigilant, if we uh, do our best to help our families be safe, we can help keep them safe online. Um, here's a, just a summary of the suggestions I had today. Um, have a content filtering parental control application. Have one, install it, learn how to use it, make sure it's a good one. Uh, review the apps that are installed on your mobile devices and on your PC. Know what those apps are. Uh, don't just look at something and assume, oh, well, that says calculator and that's okay. Uh, there are apps that, like I mentioned before, that have innocent names that uh, are used to access content that maybe we don't want our families to be exposed to. Uh, never give administrative rights on a local PC. Uh, that goes for Mac, that goes for Windows. Um, like I mentioned, once you do that, uh, your, your ability to limit or, or put controls in place are, is, is, uh, is very small. Uh, have a family usage policy that everyone understands. Talk about your fam talk with your family about what is expected. Talk with your family about um, that the just because there's an internet uh, connection in your home, it's not free reign to go wherever you'd like. That just because they're walking around with an iPhone, they don't necessarily have rights to install or do anything they'd like on it at any time. Uh, have a a policy that everyone understands and that they all agree upon. Uh, be active in monitoring use and installed applications. Look at where your family's going online. Look at their reports. Uh, look at what they've got installed. Know what they're using. And then the last one is monitor social media and web usage. Um, a lot of times, uh, many of us are sucked into that trap of thinking, well, if we know where they're going in a web browser or um, what they, what the websites that they accessed, we, we, we've kept them safe. And the world we live in now obviously uh, changes very, very frequently. And, the way our kids communicate with others is just as important as, as the websites that they're accessing. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple free uh, resources that we have on our website. Um, we record all of our webinars. So this one today that, that we've just uh, had, we will record it and, uh, and post it online as well. Um, but uh, some really good webinars are Seven Online Traps, um, Tips for iPad iPhones and iPads, uh, monitor teens and social networks, but there are several of these that are hosted on our website if you go to netnanny.com, Learn Center webinars, um, and, and there's some really good information, uh, ideas on how to keep your family safe. Uh, the other one is that we've actually created some printed materials that are free to download, um, internet safety for parents, social networking challenges, five tips to follow when you talk to your teenagers about pornography. Uh, these are great. Uh, tools to use as you uh, communicate with your family um, and good ideas to help keep you safe online. Um, I, I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, I hope that the ideas we've given you have been useful. 
Um, I recognize that this is a changing market, that new, I, new technologies come out all the time. Um, some of these suggestions are um, common sense, but some of them hopefully are, are new to you and their ideas on how you can ke help keep your family safe. Um, I, uh, this completes the, the, the webinar for today. We are going to open it up to any kind of questions that anyone has, so um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time back over to RJ, and uh, hopefully he can go through some of your questions and we can try to answer them for you. Thanks yeah, for your time. Well, yeah, uh, thanks, Clayton. Um, one of the questions that, that kind of comes up frequently is um, a lot of people are interested in these app um, or these uh, messaging apps, and they want to know if there's a way that they can view past texts that are sent that have been deleted, whether it be text message, SMS, or through a, a Wi-Fi app such as WhatsApp. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. Most of the, the messaging apps that are installed have an option where you can go in and choose to keep a history. Um, and uh, obviously you can turn that option off, so if you're kind of trying to hover, cover your tracks, it's, uh, it's not something that, uh, you would wanna, that a teen would maybe want to leave on. Uh, but you can leave it on to uh, record a history, and um, it's something you can go back and review. Depending on the application, some of them actually um, make those those messages available to view online so you can um, actually view those messages without having to go back and pick up a cell phone or um, a, a tablet if, if you're interested in in what they're uh, what they're saying for example and, and this is just an example there's a there's an application for iOS and Android called handset SMS and it's basically a text messaging alternative but the great thing about it is when you set it up there's an option where you can say record all of my messages online then you can actually log in and see all those messages. So, uh, depending on the app, most of them have the op option to uh, to have history, um, but you have to turn it on. And depending on the app, it, it it's harder to uh, to see it if you have to pick up the phone, obviously, other than just looking at a website. So, I hope that answers your question. Uh, another question we're getting is from Janet Richardson. She asks, "Do smartphones have an administrator? Um, and if so, is it possible to set up?" You know, that's a great question. So, um, smartphones don't necessarily have an administrator. Um, Android has what's called it um, giving someone administrative rights, but they don't actually do that to to users on the on the device. They do it to um, to applications. Um, the The rules of of keeping someone from being an administrator on a smartphone or a tablet. Um, don't really apply like they do on a PC or or a uh, or a Mac. Um, it, it, there are well within Android um, and uh, within the new iOS 7 the, the ability to create separate users, um, but those users still could potentially install apps or or do things to the device. Um, what I would suggest is um, for a mobile device, for a, an Android or for an iOS device, is that um, in iOS, you go in and use the embedded parental controls. You can go to settings and restrictions. Under restrictions, there's a whole bunch of things you can choose to lock. You can stop people from installing new apps. You can stop people from deleting apps. Um, you could actually change it so people can't change their account settings. So, for example, on my uh, my 11-year-old's iPad, I've I've um, I've set up a an account form for email, but I've also locked it so he can't change it to a different account. Um, so those options are available in iOS. Um, in the case of Android, your your best bet is to really install a, a parental control or an app manager. Um, and I'm I'm not trying to pitch NetNanny. But obviously, I'm I'm biased, but NetNanny does a really good job of that because once you install it, you can actually lock apps or you can stop people from installing new apps. So, I hope that helps you out. And we have a question here from Olivia Eller, who's interested in NetNanny Social. She asks, if we own NetNanny Social, how many devices does it cover? As we have a number yeah, of children, we need to protect. That's great. That's a great question. So NetAnty Social is a little bit different than than a lot of software that people are accustomed to using. It's actually a cloud service, so you don't install it on any computers. You use a website to configure it on what social networking accounts you want to monitor, and there's actually not a limit on the number of accounts you can monitor for your family. So um, as long as uh, you know you're all within the same family and you want to set all those accounts up within NetAnty Social you could set as many up as you like. And the great thing is it's not tied to a device. So if you're monitoring, let's say, your son's Facebook account, 
um, you don't have to worry about it being installed on his iPad and his phone and your PC and um, you know wherever else he uses it. Um, you're monitoring the account, not the not the device. So if he goes and sits down at, at a computer at, at school and logs into Facebook, you can still do that same monitoring. So that's why we made it a cloud service. Great. Um, okay, so we have time for just one last question, and uh, you know we're sorry if we weren't able to get your question today, but feel free to send us an email and we'll be happy to respond. But this question is from Mamie Rand, and it says, when reviewing installed apps, is opening it up enough to see what it's all about? You know, that's a great question. Um, I would say yes, um, to a point. If you if 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 you open an application and uh, and you you can tell what it does, and it's not password protected. That that'll give you a pretty good idea of what the application's doing. Most of the apps that are hiding um, hiding something will, uh, when you open them, they'll prompt you for a password, and then uh, from there it'll it'll get you into the hidden stuff. So uh, I would say opening the app and you know tapping on a couple things to make sure that it actually works or does something is is a good is a good way to do it. Um, it's always best. I mean, if you if you have any question at all, just to to Google it. Um, Google Play and uh, iTunes have great descriptions of what the apps are. So you know, I would say opening them is a great idea. Um, I've, I actually uh, helped a customer the other day. Uh, what she did was she was going through her, her son's phone and she would open the app to make sure that it was what he what they expected. But then if she had any questions, she just wrote the name down and you know by the by the end she had five apps that she wanted to check and she googled them and it took less than you know less than two minutes to find out what the app actually does but opening them is definitely a good way to look at it um, a lot of times people are uh, not sitting at the device a lot of times they're using an app manager or net nanny to find out what's on the device so the ability to open it's really hard but yeah that that would be a good policy